Ms. Denise Paul. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman, I want to direct my questions to MOE, Ministry of Education. I want to thank uh, Minister Ong, uh, Ikang, for um, finally, you might not want to call it cow, but I would just call it that. Thank you for finally slaying the sacred cow of streaming. And of course, not without a very good prior examination. I think it's a very bold and wise move, and I want to congratulate and uh, commend the work of you and your team. So thank you very much for that. I also uh, want to ask um, if Minister can consider <laughs> also the other... Uh, phenomena, uh, the features that I've mentioned, uh, just like the gifted education program, which of course has been around for a while, and, uh, and uh, I wonder if ministers can also comment if that's also a feature that can be examined and then re-looked at, uh, because I think there's just merit to having uh, uh, students who are gifted academ academically to also mix with students who are taking subjects at G1 or the former or no or normal pr uh, uh, level. So I think that it makes for a very good uh, mixing. So I wonder uh, if Minister can consider that as well. My second supplementary question is to Minister Indrani um, uh, on the SE, special education needs uh, support in mainstream, and mainstream schools and IHLs. I, I truly appreciate what uh, Minister has shared, and I know that um, in MOE from director to down to the A, AED, they've done a lot of work, and I want to honour what they do as well. But they are uh, indeed real... Um, a genuine capacity and capability issues that's felt on the ground and I wonder if we can seriously look at uh, study it first and seriously look at how we can increase the number of uh, allied educators and special needs uh, officers and support at the IHLs in both mainstream schools and IHLs and also to look at uh, a proper uh, skills based uh, training roadmap for them because to deal with so many uh, types of disabilities and that, that kind of numbers is really not, not easy. And also at the IHL's level to consider, because they're all quite autonomous, for a ministry to consider resourcing and supporting them to form a, a more a common platform where they can uh, get together to share uh, uh, best processes and practices in order to make the uh, efforts more uh, effective and impactful. For your consideration, please. I thank Ms. Denise Pua for your views, which, which is a valid one. And in a way, the GEP issue is a smaller, is a, a, a smaller issue compared to the SBB issue that we were considering. So actually, this year, there are three um, GEP-centered schools, Nanyang, Nanhua, Rosai. They already started mixed-form classes for GEP students. So just like SBB I mentioned earlier, 50% of curriculum time they spend together for various subjects. And then only when it comes to math, science, English, and social studies, they then break out into their GEP classes. So I think changes are already happening. Uh, we note your point. It is exactly the same balance that we are trying to, 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 to optimize, and we'll continue to work on that. Mr. Chairman, I th thank uh, Mr. Nispoa for our clarification. Indeed, the numbers are large. Um, so what I can say to Ms. Poa is that we will continue to do more to see how we can support students with Zen in our schools. Uh, it's not just a question, obviously, of the AEDs, but also the teachers, the peers, and building up an environment that is generally supportive. Uh, so we've made quite a lot of headway in the last few years, and we will continue to do so, and we will certainly uh, take her suggestions into consideration. Dr. Intan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to address my... I have two clarifications, one for each minister. Um, first to Minister Ong. Um, I spoke also about um, SOTA and sports school. So since we are, we will eventually abolish academic streams by 2024, Will there be plans to eventually take students beyond just the express stream for both SOTA and the sports school? And the second question is CRES and SPECTRA. Eventually, is there still relevance for CRES and SPECTRA to just have normal technical students? Will it um, be absorbed into, uh, as a mainstream school where they can um, admit students from across all uh, abilities? Yeah. Then for Minister uh, Indrani, just a couple of questions on special education needs. Are there plans to let all pre-service um, teaching programs in NIE also include at least one module on teaching students with special needs? Because at this moment, I think only specific groups of pre-service teachers are trained 
to teach students with special needs, but will, will there be plans to let all pre-service teachers um, who are, so that they are trained to manage students with special needs? And beyond just resources um, that are under teaching or schools, <coughs> what about increasing awareness among students themselves? Are there plans, for example, to include awareness about students with special needs in common subjects for all students, for example, in character and citizenship education lessons? so that they know how to manage classmates who have special needs. Thank you. First on uh, Singapore Sports School and SOTA. Sports School already take in students from all three streams, actually. And they also have tie out with Republic Poly, so that some of the students, when they finish, they go to Republic Poly and continue sports-related education. SOTA takes in express stream students plus those in the option band where they can opt for both express as well as NA. And the reason is because SOTA offers an IB program, International Baccalaureate program. So there's also a responsibility for the school and the system to recognize that IB is quite an academically rigorous program and you want to make sure that the student can keep up and not end up, cannot cope and losing confidence totally. And so I think for the time being, so long as SOTA continues to offer an IB program, I think you will take in express students. However, in time to come, when the three streams are merged, I think it will naturally have to relook at how, what kind of students it takes in. And it's no longer definitively just express stream students. As for Spectra and CREST, as I mentioned in the speech, uh, speaking to Spectra and CREST students, they feel so much better being in a school where there's a whole school approach to recognize that they are probably better at doing technical jobs, hands-on jobs, and develop them in that direction. So I think, as I mentioned, there is value to have diversity across schools, having schools that focus on certain segments of students, but at the same time, the bulk in the middle have diversity within the school, which is what we are trying to achieve. <coughs> Ms. Intan asked about what we're doing to uh, equip teachers uh, to train students with, uh, to, to deal with students with special needs. For, well, there's training for basic awareness for SEN. MOE has equipped all beginning teachers with a basic understanding of SEN since 2005 through a compulsory module in the NIE pre-service training. This enables the teachers to understand and manage the learning demands of the students with SEN. Then you also have teachers who are trained in special needs. A core group of teachers in every school is equipped with a deeper understanding of SEN through a 108-hour certificate level training that's known as the Teachers Trained in Special Needs or the TSN course. And as of July 2018, 512 teachers have been trained under the revised TSN program and some of these TSNs go on to acquire deeper knowledge in SEN support by attending disability specific training modules. With regard to peers, um, the member is correct, you do want the students, the, the, the other students to be empathetic uh, to students with SEN and generally know how to relate to them. When I visited uh, some of the IHLs, and spoke to some of the students with SEN, they mentioned that when they were younger, they were often misunderstood. Um, the peers didn't talk to them, wouldn't sit down and, and interact with them. And I think that really did have an impact on them. But helping students to understand what it is to be a friend to someone with SEN makes a huge difference. And it's not a one-way thing, it's two ways, because the the, the the, the child without SEN is also learning what it is like uh, and um, receives you know, uh, knowledge that way as well. So we will continue to work on that to make sure that the, their peers uh, interact well with them. Mr. Sia Kemping. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, my questions are directed to Minister for Social and Family Development, Mr. Desmond Lee. First, I welcome the changes to the Comcare Assistance Schemes uh, for both the short to medium term as well as the long term. One. I note that this is part of regular reviews which the Ministry conducts, and in this instance, it's uh, quite a hefty jump, uh, up to about 20%. Uh, so my, my question to the Minister is whether uh, in this, these reviews, could they be undertaken more frequently and the, the, the adjustments be more incremental, but do it more, frequent, more, more regularly? My second uh, supplementary question uh, 
is relating to when the Minister spoke about how government is helping Singaporeans in, in the area of social mobility and inequality. Minister mentioned that uh, they're starting some pilots together with uh, um, MND, uh, launching community links at or near rental flats to offer more integrated and coordinated support and customised programmes and services for <coughs> families living there. Uh, two supplementary questions. First one is, how will Community Link support the families within the neighbourhood? And secondly, how can partners, whether they are corporates, their community or residents, contribute to this initiative? And Mr Chair, if I can speak on your behalf, uh, I know one of them is in your constituency, so I'm sure you welcome that. that part. Totally. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, in terms of the ComCare reviews, we conduct them regularly. So every two to three years, over the past ten years, we've been making adjustments. But we'll take on board the member's suggestion to see whether we can make uh, incremental adjustments uh, more, more frequently, as opposed to make uh, jumps every two to three years. Uh, he also asks about ComLink. I've articulated ComLink as a social service hub embedded uh, at or near rental housing to be able to tackle and address the challenges that rental housing families face. Uh, look at each family's circumstances, starting with families with young children, understanding their needs holistically, rather than looking at the issues they face. So look at the individual, look at the family, understand what are the uh, challenges that uh, uh, hold them back, that hold them down, what are the risks that uh, poverty gets transmitted to the next generation and the next generation and uh, work together with relevant government agencies, work with the families, understand what their dreams and aspirations are, work with community partners who will come in to the com Comlink and integrate our support for these families. And of course, work with the neighbours because they are not beneficiaries and clients. There are people living there who have abilities, who have uh, leadership, who have initiative, and who themselves may have found ways to improve their lot in life. And then they can share examples, support each other. Now, the Comlink is an example of how we want our future of social service integration to be, working together, looking at families holistically, rather than individual needs, looking at the whole rather than silo and compartments. And it, in a way, the Comlink is a microcosm of what we're hoping to achieve at the broader level, at the town level, at the community level. And that is why we established SG commun Care Community Networks in each and every town all across Singapore. And I'll speak more about that by way of a, an update during MSFCOS, so please stick around for it. Uh, but in essence, the uh, member asks how Comlink approach can benefit the wider neighbourhood. I think that integrated approach to tackling complex challenges in order to achieve maximum social uplift for these families is the way we want to go. In terms of corporates and partners, uh, the Comlink uh, white spaces or community spaces will be places which community partners who wish to see their giving achieve maximum impact, they can go there. They can say, I would like to support these families and not just give generally. I want to see outcomes. I want to see upliftment in these households. I want my colleagues, my staff, my vendors to partner these families, walk the journey with them until some of them have a better life ahead of them to look forward to. And so Comlink is not just a government initiative. It's a platform that allows the broader community to come in. Companies, philanthropists, donors, volunteers, givers. But working together in an impactful way, in an integrated and coordinated manner to uplift people's lives. Reminder to members to direct more of the questions that related to the ministry subsequently during the COS. Uh, Dr. Lili Neo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to have two supplementary questions, one for Minister Indrani Raja, the other one for Minister Desmond Lee. Um, 
for Minister Indrani Raja. Earlier on, you mentioned on the expansion of after-school after care. Can I ask her how many community or grassroots initiated after-school care there are in the community and whether she could uh, support or even take our CATCH Plus. Uh, CATCH Plus stands for Children and Teen Community Hub, initiated in or started since uh, 2014 at Kreta uh, I Precincts, uh, that is at the Jalankuku rental blocks, um, which is a holistic care program for the disadvantaged uh, children there with now 100 members, uh, membership right now. So whether, you know, she could more or less MOE could help that with that one and maybe take over the the Catch Plus Centre. That's my first question. Uh, for Minister Desmond Lee, can I ask on the com link, um, may I ask him, like, what kind of outreach will they be? Because that's most important as the core success for this project. And whether, um, whether, whether there will be enough social workers that can have a hand holding approach to all these uh, disadvantaged families with multifaceted problems and also whether we can have a long-term basis approach for the children of such uh, families. Thank you. I thank Dr. Lin Nyo for her, her question. Um, maybe I can outline what the the thinking of the philosophy behind Uplift is, and I'll address the, the question. There are some things that should be done in the school within curriculum time by teachers. Then there's something that can be done in the school, but not part of the curriculum and not necessarily by teachers. And then there's things which can be done in the community. So the, the student care centers, which is after school, is really a facility that's provided outside of the school curriculum. And for that, what the school does is the school provides the premises um, and the school works with others to provide the, the programs. So the Big Heart Centre, for example, was uh, one of those. That's the three self-help groups that have come together to provide services and they work together with the school. Uh, so that's what the, the expansion of student care centres is about. Then you have things which are in the community. And for that, there is actually a value to having community-based programs because not everybody may want to send their children to a student care center. Uh, as you know, when you live in a rental block, sometimes the parents, they work shift hours. The, they prefer their children to be at home at a certain time. They can't collect them from school. So we would like to encourage VWOs as well as grassroots organizations and other community projects to continue. The question is how to link them up. The Catch Plus program that uh, the member referred to is actually a very good program. Uh, I visited your constituency um, and I was introduced to the Readable program. I was very impressed by the work that they're doing there and there is value in that. So it would not be so much a situation of MOE taking <laughs> over community programs like that, but what MOE and Uplift Office can do together with MSF is see how we can link up, coordinate better, and if programs like that need assistance or support, then we will see how we can connect you with the entities or persons who can better support such programs. Chairman, I thank the member for a question. Uh, if I may just venture uh, an additional reply on the Catch Plus program. Uh, the member had also described to me in detail how Catch Plus works. Catch Plus is in Jalan Kuko. It is where the uh, Comlink for Jalan Kuko will operate. And certainly we will work very closely with uh, the uh, people working in Catch Plus to ensure more integrated support for young people living in rental housing. That particular group that we are very focused on. And of course, I've spoken earlier about the local community network. We're starting off a pilot uh, in, in Boon Lay uh, because we have uh, a comlink there as well. Uh, but you begin to see 
how our structures that we will start to put onto the ground uh, begin to kind of uh, relate to each other and work with each other. So uplift the, the uh, program office, the, the uh, LCN support in the schools will identify younger people uh, who may have difficulties and often you'll find the challenges begin at home or the derailers come from beyond them from the family uh, and so it's not something you can just tackle in school you really need to work together with the social workers work with the family members work with the siblings work with the local community there uh, to provide that scaffolding and support so that a young person can thrive and not have promise snubbed out in terms of uh, Comlink outreach, as I said earlier, uh, rental housing should not just be a, a promise of infrastructure and shelter. It is shelter where you have no home and it comes with social support. And that's why initially we called it a social hub. Rental housing coming with social services and social services being proactive, being integrated, being at your doorstep. A journey of social workers and community services with these families when they're at their lowest points in life. And so the Comlink uh, will build an understanding of the families uh, living in the estate that they serve. Uh, and it's a composite picture that we need to put together with all our partners. And this also involves outreach to these families, starting with families with young children, understanding their situation, understanding very importantly what their dreams are for themselves and in particular for their children. That was what uh, SMS Maliki found in Project 4650, when he, PAVE, and many other community groups worked together, conferenced monthly, to understand the challenges and dreams of each and every one of the families they serve, until they see light at the end of the tunnel. It may take months, it may take years, it may take a very long time to happen. But the kind of support, integrated, interlocking, I think will make uh, a, a difference. So in terms of outreach, uh, it will be proactive. We will reach out to, to these families and seek their participation and partnership along this journey. Any other clarifications? Associate Professor um, Walter Tessera. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I agree completely with the Minister for Education that a good AU is one that uh, suits students and develops their full potential. Uh, so to support that goal, I would like to ask the Ministry uh, if, they could have, if we can have a commitment to at least study resource sharing for library materials, as I filed, uh, because the disparity in access uh, can have serious consequences for learning and for scholarship. And it also may be cheaper for us to study uh, sharing library resources across the AU that may allow for economies of scale in bargaining, for example, with the publishers. Uh, just to share a personal anecdote, I do have colleagues who actually use their alumni email account, um, alumni library accounts from their PhD granting institutions in order to get access to certain uh, library materials. They find this easier uh, than trying to rely on their own institution's resources, and I think we have to fix this problem. Thank you. Thank you for describing the practical problem you face, and yes, I'd be happy to study that. Ms. Antia Ong. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, SPS Faisal, for, for giving me a direct response to my card. I appreciate it. Uh, I have two clarifications, one to SPS and the other to Mr. Ong, please. Um, the first is that um, I absolutely agree um, you know, about the programs that you have um, started um, to support the psychosocial well-being of our students. May I ask what, how widespread is the implementation of these um, initiatives like peer support programs in our schools and IHLs and what sort of uh, results are we seeing so far? Um, the question, uh, second question to Minister Ong, uh, I think we all agree that there's no health without mental health. Uh, and I also agree that mental health is complex and multifaceted and therefore there isn't one clear solution. Uh, but I wonder if a good um, way to start is to reframe the way we see health education in schools. Uh, right now we know that health education is compulsory but it's confined to physical health education. Uh, will we be looking at mandating health, mental health education as part of health education requirement in schools so that our children know from a young age that both aspects of their well-being are equally important. Thank you. I 
thank the member for the supplementary question. Uh, indeed, we look at mental health as something that we want to build the social and emotional competency of our children, as well as build the resilience in the programs that they undertake. So, in essence, we start at a very early stage of their education, at primary school level, whereby all these values, experiences, and components where a child can develop him or herself emotionally, socially, and that resilience in all the programs that we undertake. And we take on an approach of uh, prevention, early detection and intervention, and of course, we also engage the parents along the way. And many of our schools have peer support program where we see the benefits of having peers looking out for one another. I, for once, I, not only once, I think a few times, whereby I've come across situations whereby peers supporting each other, peers informing the educators about some of the issues faced by their own classmates, and the issues are being resolved not only by one person, but together as a community. So like I said earlier, it takes a many hands approach whereby we want to see how we can enhance the journey, education journey of a child, uh, regardless of where they come from and regardless of the experience that they have, so that they continue to be socially and emotionally resilient and able to have a fulfilling and meaningful educational journey here in Singapore. I think there is no disagreement that mental health is part of health, you know, together with physical health. And in fact, you speak to students today, teenage students, mental health is one of the top issues of concern in their mind. I spoke to many of them. So, my only, uh, so definitely this is something we have to look into and continue to improve. But what I want to seek the understanding of members is that the mode of delivery uh, doesn't always have to be in the curriculum and other lesson and other few talks uh, taking up curriculum time. In fact, I think for mental health education to really work, it has to be delivered in a different way, such as through peer support groups that uh, SPS Mohammed Faisal talked about, and also general public education which students now receive through their, through, through their social media channels. So I think let's explore different ways and not always channel through the formal education, MOE education curriculum. I think it's more effective that way. Mr. Saktiandi, Supa. Um, Mr. Chairman, I have a, my clarification question is regards to my ITE cuts. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that Minister mentioned in his speech that all IT students are not disadvantaged. I think he certainly mentioned that. Um, in relation to my cut, um, it's with regards to the resources at ITE in general, uh, whether there'll be uh, more focus on actually providing enhanced resources to IT, particularly for ICN students like what some of the other members have mentioned as well. The second question I have is in relation to my second cut on IT uh, question, which is about the joint uh, admission process for Poly and JC. Uh, currently, for IT students, they apply for the GPAE after all the O-level students have actually applied. Um, so, uh, in my card, I actually highlighted whether there will be any tweaks to the process to ensure that IT students are not disadvantaged in the sense that they only come in after the remaining seats have already been occupied by O-level students. So, uh, may I get a clarification from Minister, please? Thank you. Yeah. First question is on IT resources. Uh, IT is well resource. First, infrastructure. Look at IT Ang Mo Kio in, in Central. Uh, very nice, uh, very nice premises that many countries look at it and thought this looks like our universities. And secondly is programs, lab uh, equipment, um, and also IT students funded pays only 3% of the total cost of delivering. So, Subsidy for IT students is also much higher compared to polytechnics or universities. And thirdly, we continue to build new pathways for IT students. And one of them, which I explained, was the Work Learn Technical Diploma, which I think will be a major program coming out of IT. So really no question about worrying 
uh, no worries about IT not resourced enough. As for the other question on JPAE, I addressed it in my speech. They do come after O level, but it's a separate queue with their separate places set aside for them. So they will not be disadvantaged in any way. Ms. Denise Poir, would you like to withdraw your amendment? Uh, Chairman, it's a COS session that is uh, substantive and at times are game changing, especially in the removal, scrapping of streaming. So thank you very much, Minister. And uh, so I thank the Minister and his Ministry for the significant work and the often very good work that's being done. And I, it takes me great pleasure to now back leave to withdraw my amendment. Is the Honourable Member given leave to withdraw the amendment? I think leave of the majority is given, the amendment is withdrawn. The question is that the sum of 12 billion, 705 million, $98,400 for 8K stand part of the main estimates. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that the sum of $710 million for 8K stand part of the development estimates. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it.